Turns out the intense cold, it cracks the piece and, and it uh, creates a piece that is, is somewhat imperfect, but the imperfection is part of the process. And it's called the wapisabi of the Japanese aesthetic. Uh, and they revere things that have imperfections. That's part of life. Our life is composed of imperfections. We make mistakes, we correct mistakes, then we move on to the next thing. So uh, they revere the fact that there are imperfections in the pieces. I think it's important when you go to the exhibit to really read the artist's statement and get a sense of what he's doing, or he or she. Uh, because I think that gives you a lot of information as you go about to, to see pieces, and you can understand them a little bit better. Uh, the Raku is, is somewhat like, it, this, these are all Raku pieces, but these pieces here are a slightly different technique and it's an old technique. It was used by the American Indians where they buried their pottery <coughs> in these glowing embers. And then the Maria pottery, which is very famous, is a black pottery, but it's produced by smothering the uh, flames and creating smoke to make a real black pottery. This is a little different. These are chemicals that are placed on the clay before it's put in the pit fire. And then when it comes out, the colors develop in the clay. So, and these certainly show <laughs> the imperfections that occur when you do something that is a little more crude. It's not controlled. You throw it in the fire and then the fire changes it in ways that you can't even imagine. So, uh, that's uh, the Raku period, and uh, the Rasta man, <laughs> the inspiration for the Rasta man was a young man who uh, took my order in a restaurant and he did a very elaborate do. And I said, I kept on looking at it, and I said, How long did it take to do that? And he said, My mother took three hours to do that. So I said, ah, Three hours, that's nothing. So I said, I'll do a Raku man uh, in the same style. It took me hours, and look how simple it is. <laughs> but that was the inspiration for my rest of man. Uh, going on, this is uh, an explanation of the process of Raku uh, because it shows you that it's, it has some immediacy about it. You put the, the pieces in the kiln, you fire them to 1800 degrees, and then you pull them out with tongs, place them in bins that have paper in them, a production material, and as soon as the paper lights up, you put a cover on it so that you produce a reduction atmosphere. That is, the flames eat up all the oxygen, and so then the colors develop because, especially coppers, become reds, turn into reds, and they're very, they're very lively, as you can see here. You know, they, they create this thing. But this piece shows that <laughs> it's not always successful. Some of your pieces come out as two pieces. Uh, and so then you're either luck stuck with throwing them away. But if we think of the process of the, the philosophy of Wabi Sabi, uh, you can put them back together and create something that says something about the history of the piece. This piece was made, and then it broke, and then it was reconstructed, and it's in the old days, when it first started, there was an emperor in, in Japan who had a favorite teacup, and it broke. So he asked his artisans to repair it. When he asked them to repair it, they took it and filled the cracks with gold. And it became so popular that people were smashing pieces to put together again to create the same effect. Uh, this is not done with gold, but
but I used uh, a copper wire because the overall appearance of the piece was that of copper, red, you know, in a coppery sense. So this is the crack filled with copper wire and stuck back together again to give it a different, a new life. So this has had a broken life and a new life. Uh, one of the themes that goes through my work is family. I have nine kids, 16 grandchildren, four great-grandchildren, with a fifth on the way. So you can see, <laughs> I'm sort of surrounded by family. And this piece I call my family. Uh, and it's just a representation of the unit of the family, mother, father, and child. Uh, but it also combines uh, other elements, found elements. I love found elements. And the found element here is a burrow, which I polished and then set the figures into. And it speaks to the, the age of the family. You know, the, my thought was that here's a burrow that has taken hundreds of years to form. And I want to put the family in this piece to represent the solidity of the family. So that, that piece. Um, in the process of going from Raku, I got a little tired of Raku because my kids said, I've got plenty of pieces of Raku, I don't need it anymore. So I moved on to a little more contemporary work. And this, these series here, as you look past the glaze, this is a particular glaze that when you put it on and it dries, it cracks and it shows the underneath pattern. And there's a pattern in both of these that I call my triangulation series. And it's an attempt to show triangulation, but to hide it a little bit. Um, then I moved to more abstract work. Uh, my caged colors here in the middle is an attempt just to allow colors to take over. And so that's, I call my caged colors. I like the outdoors, so I have a series of mountain series that I also did. Uh, these are more contemporary pieces here, and it they involve a number of elements. Um, not only do they have wood, they have ceramic, they have melted bronze wire, they have old nail, they have a, a variety of colors, and some blistered steel. So this is an attempt to move on into a more contemporary feel. Uh, my next attempt was clay painting, and I call these claytings because they're clay with a painting on them. And these are all glazes uh, that are placed on a clay base. And, uh, the problem is that if you make up your own glazes, the colors that you see when you paint are not the colors that come out of the kiln. So it's so, sometimes very tricky. <coughs> Going on from there, um, these are some more of my contemporary pieces. When I was traveling in Greece, uh, there was a small island we stopped on, and I don't even remember the name of it, but in the center of town, was a statue, it was featureless, and it was from the Cycladic era, and it was called Kuros, or Young Boy. And I took that, and I turned it into my Kuros series here, which uh, are really just pure form. I mean, it's just the forms that I made in the same pattern over and over with different glazes and different scales. Uh, in going from, from, from uh, turned pottery to slab work, I discovered paper clay. And paper clay is the addition of cellulose fiber to regular clay. When you look at clay under a microscope, 
it is tiny, tiny particles that are disks. And these disks slide against one another, and that allows the pottery to open and close their form. Uh, and that's what, what makes turning possible. If you add cellulose, cellulose are like tree roots. They're intertwined, and they're 100 times larger than the clay particles, and they're hollow. So you can imagine when you add cellulose to these tiny particles, it sucks up the clay and then forms a clay mesh. When you put it through the kiln, the cellulose disappears, and you're left with a very strong structure because now, instead of being just random uh, pieces of clay, it is now mesh. So it, you can produce much thinner pottery. And this is an example of paper clay. And you can touch this as long as you're gentle and see how this yellow begonia, which I made from very thin pieces of clay, it's actually four different forms put together and then they're put together, and when the glaze uh, melts, it sticks everything together. So it's actually four different forms, but you can touch how fine this, this is, and that's one of the features of paper clay. The other very important feature is that when clay dries out, you can just, and it cracks, and it looks awful, and it looks like you've spoiled the piece, you just slap new paper clay on top of it and proceed to do your work. So you can save a lot of pieces that way and all of your mistakes disappear. Um, in doing this, I found that cloth, which is made out of cotton or a cotton cloth, not nylon because nylon is a different form, the same concept of cellulose fibers is there in crochet pieces. This crochet piece here is my mother's mantilla that she crocheted, and then when I put it in clay, the clay would incorporate it into the crochet work, and when I fired it, the crochet work disappeared, but it still is crochet work, only in porcelain. So it's a, what I call the lost cloth method, like the lost wax method that the metalists used. Uh, this led to a whole series of what I call my babushka series. And these are, everybody has a grandmother who wore the babushka. And so that's become a very popular thing. But it's done with uh, any kind of cotton cloth or the crochet work that my mother uh, left me when she passed away. Her work is in the Smithsonian Institute uh, because she was a crochet artist and uh, so she has 20 pieces in the Smithsonian collection which I'm very proud of. Uh, going from there, there's a whole series that I have to do. This, these are extruded form. It's when clay is pressed through a form and it's sort of like a mechanical process. I didn't like it at all. So I didn't continue very much with, with that uh, form. Uh, these are, these here are weed pots that I really like in boxes. Um, and I think they have a sense of being for me. Uh, and that's why I like them. This is an irregular plate. Uh, I think the glaze was really, really beautiful. Um, I can pass around this little piece, and you can see how light this is. Don't drop it, please. Uh, and you can see that that porcelain, that paper clay is very light in form. From there, I went to uh, public art, and this piece here I call lying pine. And I'm sorry for those who uh, feel that this misrepresents the former president, but it's my feeling captured in clay. From there, uh, my parents came to this country when they were 18, 17 and 18. They came over on a ship, mostly in steerage, very cheap 
accommodations. It took them over a month to get here. And when they came, they had a third grade education and they had only the clothes on their backs. And I wanted to memorialize this journey. So when I was renovating a house built in 1769, I found these handmade nails. In those days, uh, you asked the blacksmith to make a nail to serve a particular function, and he made it by hand. So every single nail was different. It was made by hand. I could not throw these away because they represented the craft of, of hundreds of years past. But I wanted them to represent the people who had a steely resolve to come here for the long journey over the sea. And I, the sail is made out of brass, which is distressed to indicate the difficulty of the journey and the fact that they withstood this and came to this country to make America great. Those are the people who made America great. Uh, I was asked by my grandson, uh, who was starting a mural project in Greenfield, if I could make something that would fit on a um, giant brick building that was had an empty facade. I said yes, stupidly, uh, because it ended up with something that's in the next room, and it's giant birds, that, 10 giant birds that uh, have a six foot wingspan, and they were put on the side of the building, and it's called Flight of Fancy. Uh, one of the birds uh, in aluminum, you can see over there, that's smaller than the ones that are on the building, but it's the same concept. They have to be cut, they have to be ground, they have to be bent, and then they have to be put on a wall, which took my three sons, my two grandchildren, and myself 12 hours to do. So when I said yes, <laughs> I was regretting it somewhere along the way. So this is part of my bird series, and you can see I like uh, found elements. This is a cedar root that I dug out of the ground in my, on my property with some stone and the bird, and I, I tried to make them um, cohesive. Um, these are the same aluminum birds, only set in brands. Um, these are a series of wall birds, some more, and this one, uh, is to be outdoors, and when the wind hits the bird, it actually flies. So the metal allowed me to make it a kinetic sculpture in a way, uh, and I sort of like the fact that I can look out the window and I can see this ceramic bird fly. Uh, some more of my uh, pieces here that incorporate wood are here. Uh, these are more of the birds. Uh, again, uh, they're set either in granite or in stone. Um, I, I like to take a concept and then see how many things I can incorporate it in. And these are large vessels with freeform surfaces on them that incorporate the birds. Um, uh, Tom, just yeah. for the sake of time, could we open it up for questions? Sure. They might want to also get started on their assignment as well. Any questions? Yes. So what could you tell us about the corner um, piece with the branch billowing out, the red, black, what, what inspired you? 